Hey church, how you doing? Happy Wednesday. We're glad that you're here to join us on this Bible study, diving into 1 Peter. Today we're covering 1 Peter chapter 3, and I know we missed last week. There's some stuff going on, a shift in schedules and things like that, um, but we're glad, we're happy to be back. Um, today, in this chapter, some really cool, interesting topics are going to come up that we're going to be able to elaborate and kind of touch on here together right now. But I also want to encourage you to read it on your own. Ask God to minister to your heart that he would speak to you um, and that you would also get that from Jesus. I think Jesus is the best teacher. And so um, that would be our encouragement to you. Before we get into it, I would love to pray with and for you guys um, and that God would just lead us in this time of study. Just join with me, church. Father, um, we we just look to you, God. We look to you in this time of unrest, God. We just lean in um, to who you are, God. And, and and it's hard to see people hurting so much into that 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 chaos and violence would, would uh, follow um, in the midst of people's pain um, and how people think and how people even view and speak to each other, God. And um, your word says that uh, people would know that we're Christians by our love for one another, God. And so show us how to love each other better, God, um, um, how to be there for each other, how to see um, everybody as as image bearers of Jesus, um, and that we would love each other accordingly, God. And um, I just know that that the best way to healing any kind of relationship or brokenness, God, is just through you. Uh, help us to turn to you, uh, lean into who you are, God, that we would be united underneath your banner, God, your kingship um, as followers of Christ. I just pray that you would be with us in our study. Help us to learn from you, God, that you'd be the teacher, the minister, um, that you would speak to our hearts and our minds in a brand new way that we could understand you a little bit better and a little bit differently, God. Just take us out of our, our box of comfort. Uh, stretch us and grow us, Lord. Um, keep us safe. Uh, we love you. We praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, so First Peter chapter 3 starts off with a kind of controversial topic because in our society, in our day and age, Everybody is all about um, being an individual, having your own identity, and um, it starts off right away talking about husbands and wives. And um, if you've ever heard my wife or myself speak about marriage, we dive into Ephesians and what the uh, Bible's design for marriage, what God's design for marriage looks like, and what he says our roles should be, how we should love our spouses, what that looks like in, in submission and honor and how those things come together in order to produce a fruitful marriage underneath God's design. And so in doing that, it kind of touches on that in First Peter chapter 3, right out the gate. Um, and so we are going to talk about this hot topic um, and then we're going to move on to some other key points within this chapter. But I, again, I want to encourage you to read the read the, the chapter in its entirety. Allow God to speak to you. But we're going to talk on, on some key things in, in 1 Peter chapter 3. So first, we're going to start off with verse 1 in the third chapter. And it says, in the same way, wives, submit to your, to your submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that even if some disobey the Christian mes message, they may be won over without a message by their by the way their wives live when they observe your pure, reverent lives. And I kind of messed up in my reading. I'm going to read it one more time so we get a clear message, right? It says, in the same way, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that even if some disobey the Christian message, they may be won over without a message by the way their wives live when they observe your pure, reverent lives. Um Listen, I know when we hear the word submit that that might stir up something in our hearts, but we first have to recognize that we are first submitting to God. And when God says submit, submit to your husband, he doesn't mean in a meek, mousy kind of way where he is a dictator. But um, what you're doing is you're trusting God to lead your husband. And in doing so, you're submitting to your husband who is submitting to God. Like that's the order, the process that it's supposed to be in, right? And so um, I know it's kind of controversial. I know some people don't like that. I know the feminism movement says that's a big no-no. But what I'm reading in the word 
is that wives should submit to your husbands, right? Now, um, for me, it, when my wife submits to me, um, it puts more onus on myself that I need to be doing what's right. I need to be, um, if I'm in the driver's seat, then I got to know where I'm going, how I'm going to get there. And I have to look to God for that leadership. So there's like a, a little tier of like, well, God's up here. And then if it's me, but I'm really looking at God, well, then it, it kind of even skips me. You know what I mean? And so, um, for me, that's, that's kind of how it works. Um, but I like kind of what it strings together in this verse because it says, if some disobey the Christian message. So imagine, uh, you're married and your spouse isn't saved yet, or maybe you're just not, where they're not living the lifestyle that God wants them to live. Um, imagine, um, winning them over without having to preach at them. Like you're just living that example, right? Um, and the Bible talks about a woman honoring her husband into a position where he doesn't have a position at a, at the gate, but the wife honors her husband into that position, treats him though. My wife would say, you know, love your spouse as if they're the best version of themselves. And that kind of makes people rise to the occasion. And so that's kind of like what it's talking about here that, that as husbands, when they see their wives and they see the, the loving relationship that they're, that, that they have with them, it kind of loves them into a relationship. It kind of shows them the love of Jesus into that relationship. And it's a cool thing to kind of touch on because, um, we always want to change people. Like we always want to force people into thinking how we think, doing the things that we think they should be done or how they should be done and things like that. And that's not necessarily how God wants us to move. First of all, God wants us to move by example, whether or not we're talking about spouses or children or um, non-Christians or places of employment. God wants us to be the example. We'll kind of talk about that a little bit more later. But if we live that example, well, then they're going to be seeing that and that's going to be the draw, right? And if we move on down to verse seven, right? Um where it talks about husbands. Husbands, in the same way, live with your wives with an understanding of their weaker nature, yet showing them honor as co-heirs of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now, a lot of people want to focus on on that term, weaker nature. I don't think that means that, that women are like a second tier to men. I think it means that, that women have some parts of them where men are better and there are parts of uh, women that are better than men. And in fact, that's why we need each other in marriage and in a relationship. Your wife will complete you as a husband and bring you into a deeper relationship with Jesus. Your husband as a wife, your husband will complete parts of you and lead you into a deeper relationship with Jesus. The fact is that we need each other. And we're way back when God created Adam he said uh, he needs a helper. This isn't good. So he creates Eve for Adam. Um, it completes each other. And so for us to recognize that that in our relationship, in our marriage, um, dating the exact replica of ourselves or marrying the exact, exact re replica of ourselves is not a good thing. Like I would never want to marry anybody like me. We would just butt heads, right? And so instead I have this awesome wife that God has blessed me with, and she has these strengths, and I have these strengths, um, but they're not the same, right? Um, she is better at this. I am not as good as that. And so when we look at it at the Bible like that, and we're recognized, okay, recognize our weaker nature. Well, what is she bad at? What does she not excel at? What are you a little bit better at? What is, what is she better at than you? Um, you are able to complete each other. Um, but I like what it says right after that. Like this is kind of what ties it together, right? Showing them honor as co-heirs of the grace of life. So if you're co-heirs, like you're co-captains, like you are in it together. You are on the same team. So my marriage is not team Josh or it's not team Jamie. It's team Hilton. We are on the same team. And then it says so that your prayers will not be hindered. Your wife, as a husband, your wife helps you into a deeper relationship with Jesus. When things are on point, 
your relationship is more on point with God. Now let's go into verse 8, where it talks about, um, now finally, in verse 8 it says, Now finally all of you should be like-minded and sympathetic, should love believers, and here comes some crazy stuff right here, and be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil, or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing, since you were called for this, so that you can inherit a blessing. All right, so like it's giving us some kind of responsibility here as Christians um, about being compassionate and humble, not doing uh, evil back to others because they do things to you, not exchanging insults. Um, instead, we're supposed to be uh, blessing givers. Um, so we can inherit blessings ourselves. And then in verse 10, it really gets into it. It says, for the one who wants to lo love life and to see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And we kind of see words like this all in Proverbs, right? And he must turn away from evil and do what is good. He must seek peace and pursue it because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their requests. But the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. Like, this really does put responsibility on us as Christians. God says, if you want this result, this is what you must do. You must keep your tongue from evil. The Bible says a lot about how our, our tongue can be a, a killer, sharper than any double-edged sword, or um, our tongue can be a fire starter and create big forest fires, which is the small spark of our tongue, right? Um, his lips must, uh, and his lips, and he has to keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Don't be gossiping about each other. Don't be speaking ill about each other. He must turn away from evil and do what is good. So you have to choose to do what's good rather than choosing what's wrong. He must seek peace and pursue it. Go towards the good stuff because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their request. But the face of the Lord against those who do what is evil. So if there's responsibility on us to choose the right things, turn away from the bad things, um, that's how you get the peace, the success, the unity, and the love for each other. Like we, if, if we want to see our local body, our church grow, not just in numbers, but spiritually, then like this gives us a basic outline of the things not to do and the things to do. And that's going to promote love, joy, peace, and unity, success of the body. Um, so it kind of gives us a question. What do you want your life to be like? Do you want your life to be chaos ridden? Do you want your life to be stressful? Do you want your life to be um, judgmental? Do you want your life to be um, always concerned about what he or she has that you don't? Or why are they getting this and you're not getting that? Um, or are you about pursuing peace? Are you about pursuing love? Are you about pursuing unity? Are you about pursuing um, building other people up and discipleship and things like that? Once we decide what we're about, then we are able to move towards that goal. And of course, our goal should always be love. Our, our goal should always be Jesus. Our, our, our goal should always be building each other up. But oftentimes we see each other building, breaking each other down. Um, if we could be real, a lot of churches are riddled with people that want to break people down so it makes them feel better or look better. Um, that's not what it's about. Um, in verse 13, it says, And who will harm you if you are deeply committed to what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. There's a blessing in doing what's right, even when it's hard. I mean, why would it say even if you should suffer for righteousness, there's a blessing? Like, I know it's hard to do the right thing all the time. But there's good that comes from it. There's a blessing on doing what's right, even when it's hard. Um, in verse 15, it says, But honor the Messiah as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason. For, to me, that when it says give a defense, that doesn't mean give an argument 
or a debate. It means give a testimony. Like for me, that means when anyone questions, why do you believe this? Well, well, here's why. Let me tell you how Jesus changed my life, changed my situation, changed my circumstance, what he's given and done for me, how my life has been better because of God. So when anyone asks you for a reason, that's it. But also when it says who for to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, if the hope is in you, you have to live it. So you can't just say it, you have to live it. So when people want to ask you for the reason, or when you have to give a defense for, for choosing the choice that you make, you have to live that choice and be ready to talk about that choice. I think often we're comfortable like living in our like little Christian box of like, this is how we live our lives. And we are not out there telling people about Jesus. We're not out there telling people about God. We're not out there living our life unless we're at church. Like God doesn't want you to be a Christian just at church. God wants you to be a Christian to live that out at your jobs, in your front yard, at the park, when you're out to eat, at the store, when um, you're dealing with the dentist, when you're at the hospital, all that stuff. God wants you to be the same person everywhere and to have a genuine relationship that people can see. Um, in verse 16, um, it says, However, do this with the gentleness and respect, keeping your conscience clear, so that when you are accused, those who denounce your Christian life will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. There are, there are always going to be people that are seeking to tear you down, to break you down, to try and prove that you're not who you say you are or that God's not real and prevalent in your life. Like that's just always gonna be the case. So the Bible is saying that when people do this to you, that if you are living a genuine lifestyle or one that is beyond reproach, that they're gonna look foolish because they don't have a leg to stand on. And so God wants you to live genuous a genuinely a genuine lifestyle for him and that people will see that listen people don't want to see a fake christian neither does god god wants to see a real christian god wants to see someone that earnestly loves and is seeking to follow him um the world will always say oh there's these fake christians there's these radical christians there's these. And that's fine People are going to do that. Make sure that you are living a genuine and authentic relationship with Jesus. In verse 18, it says, For Christ also suffered for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God after being put to death in the fleshly realm, but made alive in the spiritual realm. Jesus, his goal is for everybody to know God, to know him, to be in relationship. He is for everyone. This is an all-inclusive thing. Everyone. He wants to change you. He wants to be there for you. He wants to uh, uh, be authentic in your life. He wants to be prevalent in your life. He wants to be involved in your life. So do we treat him like he, like he is? Or do we treat him like, like, no, this is our thing, right? Like, I don't want, I don't want to give that to this group or to those people because it, like Jesus is, is is my thing. Because I know if Jesus is who he says he is and has changed my life the way that I know he's changed my life, other people got to know. Like it's important for other people to know. It's beyond proving a point. It's beyond proving our, our, our own morality. It's beyond proving uh, winning debates or anything like that. Like Jesus is the answer. There's problems and Jesus is the answer. And we got to tell people about him like that. That should be our goal. Moving on to verse 21, it says baptism, which corresponds to this now saves you. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, like, listen, God has always been 
concerned with the real spiritual issues, with real problems, and the real solution. He's not, he's not concerned with the acts. Uh, um, um, baptism, water baptism, um, doesn't save you, but it's the pledge, the de declaration that you're living for Jesus, and it's the representation of being cleansed. Like that's, like that's what it's talking about. But the core of the issue is that Jesus is and has always been concerned with the matters of the heart. He doesn't. He 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 always called out the Pharisees for trying to look like they're righteous, to look like they're holy, to look like they're above. Uh, every every other group of people because of their position. God doesn't care about that. God's, God cares about your heart. He wants to make sure your heart is good. He wants to make sure your spirit is united with Jesus. He wants to make sure that you are in a position to know him better and to share about him, that you're knowledgeable about the presence of God in your life and that people will see that and that you will reflect Jesus to other people. Like that's what God's concerned about. He's always been concerned about the real thing, not putting a band-aid over a, a, over a wound. He goes to the core of the ailment. And so if we think about our social media age, where you see people doing these, these acts, you see people doing these spiritual things, you see, like, do you think Jesus would be as concerned like with that or just the acts themselves? Like I've seen this meme before of uh, it's like a little cartoon of um, a man who has, you know, all this nice stuff on, like wads of money coming out of his pocket and, you know, cell phone. He's got like a big necklace on and nice watches and 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 he's given like this this homeless man like like a dollar or whatever in his like little cup because a homeless man is like asking for help and and he's doing it but as he's doing it he's got his cell phone out and he's taking a picture of himself helping this man with a dollar while he has all this stuff and he's po he's boasting about it like that that's not what god wants like god doesn't want you telling people about you know what you're doing and and, and looking for the pats on the back i mean that's why the bible says we should fast you know without telling people you know and and I think that we just get a relationship with Jesus so wrapped up in in our own self and and looking for public approval and and making sure that people see what we're doing or letting people know what we're doing. I mean, you you think about it. People are just taking pictures of their meals every day. Like, look look what I had to eat today, and using their filter and stuff like that on their phone to to make their picture look really nice and stuff like that. Um, like God's not about that. God's about the real stuff. God's about the real, the real relationship. And, and he's about your relationship with other people being real. He wants you to love people um, in a real way. He wants it to be a genuine thing. And I think that's what we need to be doing right now, especially in this time, uh, in this era, um, coming out of the pandemic and um, all the protests and everything going on like like let's love people the real way let's stop being concerned about being right all the time proving that we're right all the time let's just be concerned with showing people jesus that we love them that jesus loves them and that there's an answer to the problems that the world is facing that's what we have for you this week i hope you guys enjoyed it i hope you learned something um and please make sure you read First Peter chapter three, go on and read chapter four as well. We'll cover that uh, next time. Um, let's pray real quick and then we'll be um, out of here. Father, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you that you teach us, you love on us, God, that you speak to us, that we have a living word that's able just to um, give us answers to uh, what we face today, God. That it's not just a, an old book, but it's an inspired word of, of God that that speaks to our hearts and our minds, God. And um, we just pray that we come into a deeper relationship with you, that you would move us and stretch us, God. Um, again, God, just keep us safe. Help us to love each other better today and tomorrow and the rest of this week, God. Um, just use us, God, as instruments just to bring people to your kingdom, Father. We love you. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.